and <clears throat> I'm going to ask uh, Michael Gaffney, the Director General, to say a few words by way of introduction. <clears throat> Thank you, Brendan, and uh, oh, thank you to everyone for coming in such large numbers, but we know it's to hear Peter Sutherland and not to hear me. So today it is a real honour to have Peter Sutherland back to talk on the uh, subject of migration, migration and development, and the massive challenge facing us as humanity, I would say, uh, at the moment. I think Peter may have felt I mean, that for some time he was a voice crying in the wilderness on the subject of migration and development but he has now become a central voice as we, especially in Europe, wake up to the challenges. Let me just say that we have, over the past number of years, in the multilateral context, negotiated with Ireland, and especially David Donoghue, our ambassador in New York, playing a very strong role, negotiated a framework within which we can, if we have the political will, address the, the challenge of sustainable development, migration, and humanitarian crisis. We agreed, or the leaders of the world agreed, that the new sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda would have one critical commitment to leave no one behind and to focus on the most vulnerable. The World Humanitarian Summit was one of the first tests of that. And next, in two weeks' time, we have the Migration Summit uh, in, in New York, the Migration and Refugee uh, Summit in New York. Now, it struck me in preparing for the World Humanitarian Summit that if we've given a commitment to uh, leave no one behind and to focus on the most vulnerable, is there anyone more vulnerable than a child in a refugee camp out in the, in the, in the, in the, in the deserts of Syria? But thinking of it again today, not to have competition and vulnerability, it strikes me, is there anyone more vulnerable than a child in the hold of a boat that is fated to sink in the Mediterranean, i.e. in our sea, on the borders of our continent? So I think we, in the Department of Foreign Affairs, in the Irish aid program, have been challenged in recent years to look at our programs to look at our concept of migration, to look at our concept of development, and to look at the different symptoms of crisis that maybe we have been addressing in silos. Migration is a crisis, it's a problem, it's also a symptom of a crisis. If you look at um, the protracted nature of conflicts, if you look at the situation in Africa where over 80% of Ireland's development funding goes, huge progress has been made since the uh, turn of the century under the Millennium Development Goals. And yet, with conflict, with persistent underdevelopment, and with climate change, by 2050, we can see that 28% of the population of the world will be in Africa, and that the, 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 the rate of job creation is not going to be high enough to look after everybody in the continent of Africa, unless we look again at how we relate to Africa. So I have I've said many times recently internally that we need, as a European Union, to look at Africa not as something that's out there, a place to which we give some aid. It is our neighborhood. Because it's not just our values, it's also our interests that dictate that Africa is our neighborhood. Because there is nowhere else for those young people to go if they are desperate in 10, in 15, in 20 years' time. And I know Peter will talk of, of speaking to migrants and refugees. There is, a, there is a, a, a good book that I read in the summer. It's a journalist's book, and, not, and that's, that's not a bad thing. It is um, The New Odyssey by Patrick Kingsley, talking to migrants and refugees coming to Europe. And they say what we hear when we meet them, too. If you're a Syrian, many people say, I'm already dead, I feel dead. Why would I not take the risk? There was a young guy from, from, from Ghana. He wasn't a refugee, really. He was more what would be called an economic migrant. And he said, we watch developments all the time. We know what's happening. We know what's being planned. But to be perfectly honest, we're going to come anyway because a dead goat doesn't fear the butcher's knife. Now, that is, that is a call of clarity, I would say, to all of us. And in our um, discussions and debates, the voice of Peter Sutherland is there all the time. And I think that's why we have such a good turnout here today to challenge us, to provoke us, and to explain to us uh, the implications of the migration crisis, the humanitarian crises, the persistence of conflict 
for us as Europeans and for the European project. And I think there's no people who should feel more able to address or more, more feel the need to address this more than, than, than the Irish with our particular history and our particular history of migration and our particular understanding not just of refugees but of the concept of economic migrants. Um, so we look forward to hearing now from Peter what Ireland should be doing more across all areas of, 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 of policy. And I would just say that <laughs> there is nobody better placed to talk to us. He is the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General for Migration Development since 2006. He was responsible for the creation of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. He's president of the International Catholic Migration Commission and a member of the Migration Advisory Board of the International Organization for Migration. And before that, we, we can't really do justice to his CV. He was attorney, he has been attorney general European Commissioner Responsibility for Competition Policy, and I think for education for a, for a period. Chairman of AIB, Founding Director General of the World Trade Organization, Chairman of BP, Chairman of the Trilateral Commission, Chairman of the London School of Economics, Chairman of Goldman Sachs, and now he is devoting his time, I think, almost exclusively to this issue of migration and migration and development. So we are honored to be here and to hear from him. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, let me say um, that I'm, I'm concerned, really, at the huge number that are here for what I thought would be an int intimate gathering, but thank you for coming. I'm also concerned because I'm very conscious of the fact, because I'm doing it all the time, that mouthing what may appear to be platitudes about migration, particularly when you're not delivering on the ground in the political turmoil that exists in Europe today, is an easy enough job. And it's perhaps a particularly easy job in Ireland, where we have had a more positive engagement to date, and hopefully will have into the future, with the issue of migration than many others in Europe have had. Let me at the outset say that those of us who consider ourselves or would like to be considered as liberals in the old sense of the word. Look back at the period after the Second World War as it blowed, blow, a, 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 an extremely important period in the development of institutions and principles. That's true of the uh, UN itself, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which incidentally specifically refers to the right to leave your country, but does not refer to any right to go to any other country. But when one looks at the European Union itself, and you see in the acquis communautaire the same basic principles about the dignity of the human person, the equality of man, that are reflected in the Charter of the United Nations. You see, at least in the expression of principles, in the expression of values, a period of time which had considerable importance. And then you fast forward to today. We have a dreadful development it seems to me, of a sort of nationalism which all of these institutions were created to stop. We have a type of nationalism reflected in parties right across Western Europe, countries which were the most important in developing these principles that I've referred to. For an example, France, who I think deserve particular credit, the sort of Jacques Maritain and others, Monet, Schumann, de and so on, at the beginning of the European Union. These countries now have, as we know, with forthcoming elections in Germany 
and France in particular being worrying, they have taken a different course, or at least a substantial number have taken a different course. And the Brexit vote in England was motivated in significant measure by the issue of migration. And all of this is a reflection, in my view, of a sort of nationalism that I reject. We've had too much of a violent nationalism in our history. We now know, surely, that you cannot define people by their race. And yet, that is what is happening right across Europe. The foreign-born population, as a matter of interest, in various European countries today is the following. Ireland, 15.8%. UK, 13.4%. Germany, 14.5%. Sweden, 18.5%. Luxembourg, 45.9%. Switzerland, 26.6%. The Irish figure is quite large. Its impact, however, is to be borne in mind in the context of the fact that the largest number of migrants that we have in Ireland are English not even British, they're English. And whether we would have quite the same relatively constructive engagement with the migration phenomenon, were they to have come from another more visibly different part of the world, we can speculate about. But I think we can be reasonably proud of where we are today. So, the post-war period had a number of values and principles, amongst which I would include solidarity, plurality, tolerance, non-discrimination as principles. And <clears throat> somebody once said of a neighbor of ours that the problem was that they had a history that they could not forget and they had a future that they could not avoid, and they couldn't reconcile the two. Well, that description of a certain type of nationalism is something that we all share to a certain point. I think it was George Orwell who made the point that nationalism, in the end of the day, is just thinking you're better than the other guy. And basically, if we scratch the surface, many of us occasionally think that, although we would deny it. So we're faced with a world today which is in the throes of the generational challenge, as the Pope has put it, of our time. And it's one that is not going to go away. It's going to get more and more important, serious, and difficult to handle. And just looking at one example of that, in terms of the African population, in 1950, Europe had a population twice that of all of Africa. Today, Africa is 40% larger than Europe. In 2050, Africa will have a population three times that of Europe. We had, a we had one million asylum seekers in Europe last year. As you know, asylum seekers, refugees, who are entitled to asylum, are quite different from migrants. Refugees are people, essentially, who are escaping from war or persecution. And under a 1951 convention that was created out of the 
terrible war that created all the other institutions that I referred to, that created an obligation born out of the suffering of Jews in particular to give sanctuary, a sanctuary incidentally denied to many Jews by many countries in the period leading up to 1939. But this was to be a brave new world. And that brave new world, to an extent, has done the job in terms of refugees. But refugees are quite different from economic migrants. Some heads of government refer to economic migrants as everyone else. If you're not escaping from persecution or war, you're an economic migrant, and you're to be sent back. <coughs> you may ask, where's the logic in that? If you're escaping from a natural disaster of an appalling kind, if you're escaping from famine, or some cataclysmic event, which is not persecution or war, have you no rights? Well, <clears throat> in Europe in particular, to refer to that to him for a moment, there has been, in my opinion, a quite appalling reaction in some countries to the issue of migration, whether it be refugees or economic migrants. The Czech Prime Minister last week said, we will take no more Muslim refugees. The Slovak Prime Minister within the last month said, we will only take Christian migrants. Slovakia, Romania, Hungary, and the Czech Republic have all refused to accept the idea of sharing of migrants. There's been a vote by qualified majority voting in the European Union, which carried the conclusion that we should share and accept an objective quota system based on GDP, unemployment, total population, and so on. We now know that on the 2nd of October, the Hungarians will have a referendum on this issue. So we're going to have a referendum on a toxic, a toxic issue like migration to upset or turn over a law that was agreed within the European Union. Where do we stand on this? Apart from our massive interest, at least in my view, in the survival of the European Union itself, leaving aside any moral concern to those who are to be denied refugee status. How can we as a continent, aspiring to a belief such as those values in the preamble to the Treaty of Rome, how can we countenance the creating of razor wire fences right up through Europe? How can we countenance the employment in the last short period of a large number of people um, in Hungary? I have to come back to Hungary again, um, where Mr. Orban referred to refugees as a, a poison. This is a challenge to the European Union. It's a challenge to the United Nations. It's a challenge to the values which we believe in. We now have, in the Brenner, the Brenner Pass, 
a historic location between the border of Italy and Austria, we now have men with guns. We have the Schengen Agreement, which even if our interests were solely economic, is of considerable importance to everybody here who's exporting products across Europe, collapsing. The cost, incidentally, of that, according to one recent survey, will be 18 billion euros per annum to the collective European countries who will lose the value of it. So, we have a very serious situation. And Ireland may be a small country on the periphery of Europe, <laughs> But we have an equal voice in the European Union. And that equal voice should be used by expressing publicly and clearly the value system which we believe to be absolutely inherent in the European Union of which we are members. We have, in the immediate future, the outcome of and the likely effects of the Brexit issue, which certainly has bolstered the support across Europe for those who would destroy the European Union itself. The, uh, I won't use the adjective that I might be tempted to use about Marine Le Pen, Le Pen but she said that the Brexit vote was the biggest political event since the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's about the only thing she said in the last year with which I would agree. But she said it. And she's right on that. So <clears throat> this is a time when Europe and the world has to start to articulate a real position and deliver on it in terms of migrants and refugees. We can't have a situation where the largest party in the most liberal of countries, namely the Netherlands, is led by Geert Wilders, another member of the same um, group in regard, to, uh, in regard to migrants. They have an election next March, as a matter of interest. Um, we have an enormous issue where we must be heard and raise our voices. But I appreciate, as I said at the outset, that it's very easy for those of us who are in multilateral organizations, and I've been careful to stay in, apart from a failed candidacy for the doll once upon a time, to stay away from the appalling uh, quagmire that is national politics. It's easy, it's easy to say these things to politicians. But I think this is a time for the expression of values. In 2005, <coughs> Kofi Annan, whom I knew when I was with the uh, WTO, contacted me and asked me to become um, he actually asked me to become High Commissioner for Refugees. Mm -hmm. And I said, I would. When? And he said, in a fortnight. And I said, hang on for a second. I'm, I don't know how I ever got the job, but I'm chairman, I said, of BP. And it's the biggest company it was at the time in Europe. I can't walk out in two weeks. Oh, well, then that's the end of that, he said. So that was the end of that. Um, and then sometime later, he came back to me again after my... The man who was appointed ended up in some domestic uh, tiff, which I better not go into. Mr. Lubbers um, uh, was appointed Prime Minister of the Netherlands, and then he had to leave his job. And I got the same phone call, and I said, well, is it a fortnight? No, he said, it's not a fortnight. He says, you can have as long as you want. Well, I said, is there a snag? He said, what do you mean? I said, I said any problem that you should tell me about. Not really. I said, what's that? And he said, well, he said, uh, <clears throat> I have to advertise the job. 
I said, you must be joking. If you think I'm going to put my hand up and then you're going to advertise the job. So that ended that. Then he came back to me a final time and said, will I become special representative, which I've done to my great um, pleasure ever since. But at that time, at the UN level, there was a strict division between the national sovereignty types led by the United States and those who believed in multilateralism. And when I went to meet the US representative to the UN, I was more or less thrown out of his office because he said, and this was Bush regime, migration is a matter of national competence and sovereignty. We can't have foreigners looking into a constitution which we think is perfectly adequate to protect the rights of individuals. And we just have a lot of people from other countries with much worse standards throwing uh, insults at us. A certain element of truth in that argument. <clears throat> but the US at that time <clears throat> was very concerned about creating any multilateral response to this situation. Well, since then, and on the uh, event of Obama becoming uh, president with a permanent representative born in this town, things have changed. And the US, in many ways, is presenting a leadership role in some of the things that we're doing. And what are we doing in the UN? Well, UNHCR is providing an enormous amount of support in camps all over the world. I went recently to Sicily, and I would say in the camp that I was there in for quite some time, that the, virtually everybody in the camp was not a refugee. So the issue is, what do we do for those who are not refugees? Do we have any responsibility for survival migrants who are leaving a, leading, leaving a natural disaster? Why should they be treated differently to people who are escaping from a war like Syria? And <clears throat> how do we deal with this issue? How do we deal with an issue where the population of migrants is defined, as I said earlier, by proximity to the cause of danger and problem? We send down our ships and save lives. We collect people, as do the British and others, from the Mediterranean, and over 3,000 have drowned already this year, but we collect them. But we only do it, or at least some of the countries in question, I don't know whether we would do it um, otherwise, but in some cases, it's only done because of the agreement of Italy to receive those who are fished from the deep. And then they are left there. So the numbers in Greece and in Italy continue to grow. <clears throat> the razor wire fences up the Balkans stop people escaping from Greece, the most disadvantaged country perhaps in the European Union. Similarly, at the border between Switzerland and Italy, there is a total blockage being imposed. All of the Balkan states are more or less in the same position stop them coming in. And who's to say that if we had the same sort of numbers coming in here, that we wouldn't also be slightly less welcoming than we may appear to be? I think we have an absolute obligation to support the relocation of migrants from Italy and Greece, and to share amongst Europeans 
with the spirit of solidarity which we have experienced for an example through the regional and social fund over years in this country share the responsibility. Now we're not the worst. There are others who are far more difficult. But it is a responsibility which we cannot avoid. And it's a responsibility which is in our own self-interest also in the context of the survival of the European Union and the avoidance of a fracturing with fissures running through every national border in the European Union. What have we to do at home? I think we have to do a number of things. First of all, the best example is probably to be found in Canada. In Canada, they sent 500 soldiers and civil servants to Lebanon to help to work out how to take, who to take fairly and reasonably and to bring them back. They also created a major connectivity between business, homes, and migrants, which has allowed for the integration of people in a way which is important. I think local authorities have a huge role to play. Mayors of cities, the mayor of Athens is a wonderful man. I spent some time with them going round and what they have done there is that camps, <clears throat> instead of being located out in the middle of nowhere, which is what happens in some places, they are split up and divided within the cities. And the schools and the whole system works effectively. And they liaise with other cities like Barcelona and Madrid, who are also providing a different approach. But in each of these countries, there is a interdepartmental structure and committee to deal with the issue of migration. And with Canada, there is a constant discussion between those who are involved, particularly the Minister for Migration, and public opinion. I asked the question of some of our well-known NGOs over lunch, is it better to not have a discussion about it? than to have a discussion. If we have a discussion, are we likely to raise the issue in a way which is more difficult to handle? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that that would be the case. In fact, I don't think it is the case. <clears throat> I think many of us are very happy with the migrants that we see and interact with in Ireland. But we do have to do a little more than just landing them in a house in a remote spot. We have to surely integrate them into the Ireland of today in a way which is sustainable and not going to create problems. So we need bottom-up governance in regard to migrants, not simply hectoring speeches like this one but bottom-up, practical implications of migration have to be addressed. And local governments are absolutely important to this. A greater devolution, as I've said, takes place in other countries. Um, but there are huge disparities. I think we have to get more serious about this than perhaps we are. <clears throat> Finally, let me say this. Ireland, through the Department of Foreign Affairs, and David Dunne, who deserves particular credit, who's here today, our permanent representative, had a lot to do with the Sustainable Development Goals, which set out a roadmap in regard to 2030, the post-2030 period, 
and which referred significantly to the positive value for development, both of countries from which they depart and send back remittances to countries to which they go, and over 80% incidentally go to third world countries, not developed countries. And those sustainable development goals were adopted by the United Nations. He then took on the role of, uh, which I've been glad to be working with him, on the role of the 19th of September, when the heads of government, we hope, of countries all over the world will come to the General Assembly and will try to map out a general series of agreements and a pathway to an international conference in 2018 which will do something effective. Now, you and indeed I get bored listening to the well-meaning platitudes that often take place at meetings of this kind. But institutions are vital, just as they are in the European Union. They can't be dismissed with an imperious wand as irrelevant. The Commission, for an example, was the one that proposed the quota sharing idea. But to, in order to defeat those who stand for a world which hopefully we all here reject, we need the articulation of a European position in particular that we as Irish people can be proud of. Not simply, and I'm not saying that this is the case at the moment, but not simply saying, well, that's over there. They're far away from us. We're like the Skibbereen Eagle. We're remote from all of this. Keep your head down and hope for the best. Well, hoping for the best isn't good enough. It's not good enough morally. It's not good enough legally. And it's not good enough economically for our future which has to be a future intimately connected with a thriving, value-filled entity, which is the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Peter has agreed to take uh, questions or listen to some comments, uh, and it's on the record. For the briefer and the shorter the speech, the better. To give a perfect example, the first is Alan Dukes, who has put his hand up. <clears throat> so, Alan Dukes, uh, a former colleague of Peter's, who didn't escape the snake pit of politics. <laughs> Peter, I think you are far too kind to this country in what you said. I agree with your sentiments and with what you want us to do. But surely we have to recognize that in Ireland, if we're going to be serious about this, we have to put an end to this iniquitous direct provision system we have where many refugees and asylum seekers and economic migrants live in dreadful conditions. And we have to give some reality uh, to bringing more refugees and asylum seekers into this country. <laughs> it seems to me we must do that if we are to participate with any kind of authority in making the kind of case uh, that you're proposing <laughs> here. It's easy for us. Most of the foreign-born people who live in this country are Europeans. <clears throat> and thank God we haven't had problems with uh, Eastern European people integrating here. Personally, I'm a utopian libertarian who thinks that people should be entitled to go anywhere they want in the world at any time. And could I also ask, do you feel that we should keep on with this distinction between, as you mentioned, between refugees and migrants? <laughs> dead is dead whether it's as a result of a bomb or a bullet or drought or famine or endemic disease. Okay. So what should we do to give ourselves some authority to participate, as Thanks you so suggest much. we should? Well, um, taking the last question first, I'm very strongly of the view that we can't muck around with the definition of a refugee. If we 
merge it in some way with uh, migrants more generally, or we water it down, we lose it. There are many countries around the world that had loved to see the end of the 1951 convention, which they've signed up to. So I think we should put a cordon sanitaire around that, however imperfect or otherwise it may be. Um, I agree, I, I'm no expert on the issue of direct provision. I actually believe that those who are waiting for asylum decisions are and, and should be allowed to work. They shouldn't be excluded from work. And um, people say that that becomes a pull factor. Well, I heard one prime minister at an earlier stage in this revoltingly say that it was a pull factor if you save people in the Mediterranean. Pull factors are not the issue. The humanity of the individuals are, are uh, the, the fundamental issue. So I basically, uh, basically agree with the view that you expressed. Over here now. Next. And you. Hi, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> Paul Colgan, uh, UTV Ireland. Um, how much of a case does Ireland and Europe have to answer with regards to global tax avoidance? Presumably, a lot of the, the people who make their way to Europe come from countries that have been deprived, tax euros sort of being sheltered elsewhere. <laughs> and secondly, you're concerned about the European project. At the moment, we have the Irish government pitched against the European Commission. Accusations are being made that the European Commission is cozying up to the big guys to the detriment of the little guys. Clearly, there's fissures there. Do you have any thoughts on either of those two things? Well, it's a, it's a neat way of getting uh, the issue of Apple into a discussion uh, on, on uh, migration. But it won't work, because I, I don't know anybody of the vast, vast numbers that I've met in camps who are there because they're avoiding tax. But uh, I know the point you're trying to make. And, um, um, <coughs> Well, I think that that's deeply dangerous, as I've said earlier, for Ireland. There, there are terrible tensions. I think that we must, in the Brexit debate and every other debate, we should recognise <coughs> that our fundamental interest is not the accommodation of anybody, much though we would like Britain to be uh, in a reasonable position vis-à-vis -vis functioning economically with us, but our fundamental interest has to be European integration. And if that requires us to take a different position on, for an example, free movement of people, then we should do it. Um, I, 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 think, I think that that has to be our fundamental position. Okay, Tim, the next question is coming from here. Okay, thank you very much. I might just stand up. Oh, certainly. Uh, thank you. I'm Anastasia Quickly. I'm currently chair of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racism. But I've long since, and I've met you on a number of occasions in that regard, been involved with migration and refugee issues. I'd like to thank you for the work that you've done. And I'd also like to commend David and his colleagues for the work they've done. Two comments and three questions. First of all, I agree fully with you that this is a very challenging time. And part of the challenge is, as you say, acknowledging that the migration flows and even the refugee flows and displaced people mostly move within the same region, often within the same country. And I think there's a huge need for all of the politicians globally to reiterate that. Secondly, uh, you answered uh, Alan Jukes very well, but I'm very conscious from the work I do globally of the mixed flows. I agree with you about maintaining the distinction between refugees and migrants because of the 51 Convention and the way in which it's flouted in a number of places. But there are mixed flows, and I think they're fundamental. Three very brief questions. Firstly, I appreciate your concern with values, but I'm fundamentally concerned, given the difficulties that people like David and his colleagues had in negotiating the concluding documents for the 19th of September, I'm fundamentally concerned, and I'd like to ask you how you see it happening, that the values we have globally, and by those I mean the values that are in the treaties that all our countries have signed up to. How can you see us making sure that those values, they're in CERD, they're in CEDO, they're in all of the treaties about women, about children, about economic, social and cultural rights, how do we make those stand up? And then my last question is, I agree with you about Ireland and the European Union, but is there not a case also sometimes for us taking an independent <coughs> stand, maybe, and trying to lead 
from in front rather than waiting for everybody else to come with us. And could we also go back to the good work that was done here after we signed up to a National Action Plan Against Racism, under which I had some association, and after we began to do things in a way that made sense, Thank for you. which there were outcomes. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, um, first of all, if we have an issue on which we could lead, I have no objection to, to, objection to our leading. And, um, I think David has played a role in that, and um, in my own little way, I hope I have done too, and uh, you can do it, but we shouldn't get beyond ourselves either, because in the end of the day, you have to bring others with you, and the intergovernmental process that is the UN is full of flaws, it's full of deficiencies, but it's the only thing we've got, and it's the only thing we will ever have, so we have to try to support it. I would like, and I hope that we have, a very active leadership in the UN, which, uh, whilst it doesn't have a power of initiative, as a commission does, has a power to, to lead, and I hope that we will be in close connection with that leadership, and hopefully it will play a real role. Now, I'm getting too bloody old. I can't remember what the other questions were. And the bad news with us after. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the only way you can keep values and the only way that that can work is through two external forces. Media, great correspondents who, who can make a real impression and effect, and NGOs. And NGOs, I think, are a crucially important part in this. And NGOs... Um, which I'm a bit involved with the ICMC, have to also balance political reality with their own constituents who may sometimes want them to go too far in articulating something which actually will alienate those who you need to bring with you. So it's a, it's a difficult position, but I think uh, NGOs are great. No, I think here was the... Gillian, straight across. Uh, hello. My name is Alex Pingott, and I don't represent anybody. Uh, but you mentioned the importance of institutions and, uh, in, the, in the, the start, and in particular, the, um, I would say that in terms of the United Nations preamble to the, to the Charter, it says that what the United Nations is supposed to do is to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Now, while the United Nations does seem to do a lot of good work in terms of, you know, what are we going to do with refugees and how are we going to develop and the uh, climate change and so on and so forth, that is the primary goal of the United Nations. But maybe that's the reason that the general population across Europe is just sees this refugees coming and our migrants coming and looking to the leadership of the world, which is where the that's the United Nations position, that's what they then they're not doing the job that they were set up to do, it's what it appears. So what do well, you think is the answer to that? Well, <clears throat> the UN is a strange construction. Um, I only did it once, but I addressed the Security Council once. And you see the big boy sitting around a table. And at the end of the day, it's better probably to have them sitting around a table than to abolish the Security Council because the effect of abolishing the Security Council would, I think, be the abolition of the UN as a viable organization. So it's a very difficult job. Um, you could also look at the EU and say that the EU is in terrible problems today, and you saw the election results yesterday in Germany, because of the perceived complicity of the EU in regard to the migrant crisis. But if there's a failure in the part of the EU, it's the failure of the countries that I've mentioned to accept a solidarity capacity and involvement that can make it work. And to blame Brussels is a bit much, I think. So I think we just have to struggle on with the institutions we have. OK. Just two there. Yep. Thank you, Peter, for a very powerful and challenging presentation. <clears throat> I, I'm Philip Carney from the Antarctica Climate Change Committee, chairing that committee. And thanks for the plug for the NGO sector. 
in your presentation, you referred to natural disasters, cataclysms, but you seem to avoid the term climate. I don't think it occurred. It's there in the, in the subtext, but I would appreciate if you would address that more directly. We know that it's a factor in, say, the Syrian situation. It's likely to be a much bigger factor in the future in Africa, so I'd appreciate if you'd address it more directly. No, it was actually, although it may have been unspoken by me, climate change was exactly one of the things I was talking about when I said that people uh, may have to leave their countries for other reasons, which are just as challenging and dangerous to them as um, war and climate change and its effects might be one of them. I was in Bangladesh recently, a huge proportion of the land of Bangladesh is below sea level. Um, it's an appalling potential catastrophe, but so I agree with you. Um, Michael Foley from the School of Media and DIT. You mentioned the same uh, breath as NGOs, you mentioned the media as well. I'm just wondering, you who presume you are looking at the media throughout Europe, for instance, how well or not do journalists understand the issues and how far has, say, the negative attitudes in parts of Germany and Hungary and wherever, how far, and I know it's very hard to get cause and effect here, but how far has maybe the fact that journalists don't understand the issues or have been very negative in their um, at least commentary has added to the sort of anti-refugee and migrant feelings in some parts of Europe? Well, I think it's a huge point, but I mean, my own inability to read the media in a whole range of different countries doesn't qualify me <laughs> to give an overall survey. But if you take somebody, somebody mentioned Kingsley, um, the, the um, Guardian is very well informed on this issue. I could name another number of other uh, <clears throat> print media sources in the same country who are toxic on the issue, but they get toxic on me if I mention their names. They say I do it too much as it is, so I better be careful. Um, so I think, I, I think the media are vitally important. Um, and they were vitally important, dare I bring up the subject again, by their absence of critical analysis on Brexit, which in time will show. Okay. One last question. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Quick, Lee, very quick. Thank you. Um, my name is Bruno Chad Bushich and I'm representing the Irish Serious Solidarity Movement. Peter, thank you so much for your presentation and all your work on this topic. Just in terms of what Ireland can do, I mean, we're very grateful that um, Ireland has uh, committed to accept 4,000 people, both through resettlement and relocation, but there's still a residual of 600 people. And one of the, among all the concerns that Syrians in Ireland have, both residents and refugees, is family reunification. And I know that this is one of the issues that's going to be brought up at the UN Summit. Um, in terms of what the Irish government can do, um, like just to prevail upon them to uh, grant Syrians uh, in Ireland their at-risk relatives in Syria and surrounding countries um, the right to protection here uh, under the IRPP, the International Refugee or the Irish Refugee Protection Programme, with the same rights as refugees here, and also that refugees, both Syrian and, and all refugees here, have um, like uh, just to ensure their rights to reunification with vulnerable extended families members and um, this is a huge issue and it's you know going to be tightened up under the new international okay. uh, refugee protection act and also there's going to be a, a 12 month limit even for members of nuclear families on their right to apply for reunification okay. so what can be done in that i agree with you is that a sufficient answer but i do <laughs> <laughs> i probably won't here. but you're right okay. basically please Hi, I'm Marissa Ryan from Oxfam, and uh, thanks to Peter and also to Michael and to David. Um, just a quick question regarding Ireland's role within Europe. I agree that we do have potential to play a stronger um, role at the moment, especially gearing up towards 2018 when the new compact will be agreed. But for us, one of the um, disturbing parts of the summit was that there was a failure to agree concrete actions. So going towards the summit, um, if you were Francis Fitzgerald or whoever represents Ireland at the summit, what do you think will be necessary for Ireland to commit to um, if we're to be seen as a more responsible player and therefore able to negotiate better at EU <coughs> level to actually improve the situation well, for Europe? Well, the negotiated outcome document, um, whilst it has many merits, it does not have the merit of sufficient concrete actions. And uh, the question really was, did we kick the ball off 
in terms of 2018 with a ringing endorsement of principles, or did we get specifics into it? I should say David particularly had, had a role in this. I think what was done, and not everybody still agrees with it, was as good as could be got. But I agree with you. I mean, taking a percentage of the total number of refugees each year and committing the global community to share them would have been a good thing. But um, we had to get the line ball across the line, and that's the issue. So it's, <coughs> I, I agree basically with the point that you're making. I just want to express on all of our behalf uh, <coughs> our deep thanks to Peter. Uh, he uh, referenced the summit on the 19th of September, high-level summit on uh, refugees and migrants. <coughs> Let's note that as to whether we will be speaking up at that. I think the mood of which he spoke was somber. He comes across, obviously, as a moralist, and I think a voice like that has got to be articulated at this present time. He is calling on Irish society, on Irish government, to... Uh, to be heard. Of course, to be heard, you have to speak. And to be properly heard, you have to speak up. And we'd better do all of that, I think. We would be very greatly, I think, um, stimulated and indeed inspired by, by his words. But more than, not just by his words, but by his demeanor, the way in which he has conducted himself here today. And the, obviously, the deep concerns that he has for a whole range of issues, but also the deep passion that he has particularly for refugees and for children. Uh, his final comments about the future of Europe need to be reflected upon here in this house. I don't think that uh, we have faced such an existential threat to the European Union as we currently do this very moment. I think for the reasons that he articulated so well. It's been a, a very broad agenda, as you can see, that he has, has addressed. Uh, and it emphasizes the interconnectedness of so many different huge issues as, as of the moment. We're thankful to Irish Aid for having enabled us to have the opportunity to hear him and to work with him uh, yet again. Uh, and I'm happy to say that we have agreed in principle that he will return here in November when he'll be talking about a, a major report in this whole area. And in the meantime, all we can all do, and I do so fervently myself as a friend and colleague, is to wish him well. Uh, just to close the uh, proceedings, I'd like to ask our ambassador to the UN, David Donoghue, just to talk about one or two things that he's been doing himself, but also to put today's event in context. David. Thank you very much, Brent, and thank you to the Institute. I suppose I just wanted to say from the vantage point of the, of the UN uh, um, that Peter Sutherland's role, I think, is finally being uh, vindicated in the uh, summit which will take place on the 19th of September. The uh, content of that summit is not perfect. There were many ways in which I and my colleagues would have liked to see it go further. But I, I think Michael mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, uh, he, he mentioned that Peter in a way was a lone voice for a long time. And I, I can see that, that uh, over many years Peter was the only voice basically. But behind the scenes he was uh, building up remarkable momentum. And I know that the very idea of a conference which would examine these issues at the global level, it goes back to Peter. Um, so I, I think that he has been, uh, he's finally getting the recognition within the UN system, which uh, he uh, thoroughly deserves. He, of course, internationally has uh, uh, been a remarkable advocate for migrants, for, the, for, for, for a whole range of issues relation to migrants, uh, and his, his own passionate advocacy has been, uh, uh, has won him huge respect. But I'm glad that within the UN, finally, uh, the work he has been doing behind the scenes uh, is, is bearing fruit in the conference which will happen on the 19th of September. I'll just say that um, um, I, I echo very much the tribute paid to the work of uh, NGOs. I've benefited greatly in New York from the input of NGOs, uh, a number of whom are represented here, both in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals negotiations and in relation to the migration and, and uh, refugee negotiations, which in many ways were more difficult, I have to say. 
So in framing the uh, initial draft of the document for the 19th of September, I benefited huge, hugely from uh, the clear moral positions taken by, uh, by many NGOs, both Irish and, and international. And on the very issue that uh, I think Peter referred to, the issue of children in, 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 in detention, you know, on that type of issue, uh, we were guided very much uh, uh, by what NGOs have been saying. Inevitably, if you have 193 member states whom you have to get over the line, and not all of those would be guided by liberal values, to put it mildly, then um, there is going to be some dilution. Um, I would like to think that the dilution isn't too... Uh, extreme. Uh, obviously, as a sort of part author, I, I, I hope that it's not too extreme, but I think if one stands back from it, uh, there is enough in this document which will be an, uh, issued by all the heads of state and government on the 19th of September. There is enough to show that there will in future be a more humane, a more compassionate regime to support both uh, uh, refugees and migrants. The key phrase used is large movements, large movements of refugees and migrants. And indeed, somebody referred to mixed flows. That is a very important point, and that is one reason why the summit uh, is going to address, for the first time ever, the challenges represented both by refugees and, and migrants, uh, because many of them find themselves in so-called mixed flows, and increasingly we have to address these challenges together. Um, uh, it is, I think, the case that the sanctity of the 1951 Refugee Convention will be reinforced by the, uh, uh, the 19th of September summit. At the same time, there is a greater emphasis on the need for migration to be given a similarly uh, binding legal framework. Uh, and the process to which Peter referred is one which will end up in the articulation of a new global compact on migrants, on migration, in 2018. So much of the detail which we weren't able to capture in these negotiations now in order to get a, a document agreed by all. Much of that detail will be addressed in the, the negotiations over the next two years, leading to this specific compact on migration. And in that, uh, Peter, as special representative, will, will be playing uh, a key role. So those are really just a few comments. I thank the Institute for having invited Peter and uh, uh, given us all an opportunity to, to mark his own achievements and to contribute to this debate. Thanks, Benny.